Hello everyone, I'm Paige Smith with Below the Radar, a knowledge democracy podcast. Below the Radar is created by SFU's Fan City Office of Community Engagement and is recorded on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Today we have guest Farinik Farzan, a faculty member in SFU's School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering and the founding director of eBrain Lab. Baranek works in the fascinating field of neuroengineering, innovating tech solutions to better diagnose and treat mental health issues. Today, she speaks with Am Johal about the several research initiatives she leads at SFU and beyond. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Below the Radar. Really excited to have Dr. Farinak Farzan uh, with us. She's an assistant professor in the School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering and the Chair in Technology Innovations for Youth Addiction Recovery and Mental Health, as well as a whole series of other uh, things. Welcome, Farinak. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, wondering if we can just begin, why don't you introduce your work uh, a, a little bit and how you found yourself uh, coming here uh, to SFU to work on on uh, your really interesting uh, research. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Aim. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this. So, um, as you mentioned, I, I do. I am in the department of um, in the Faculty of Applied Science, School of Mechatronic Systems and Engineering. Having said that, um, I have uh, a background in both engineering and neuroscience. So I, I work in this domain of neuroengineering, uh, some may call it. Um, so going a little bit back and, and going over my background, I did my electrical and biomedical engineering um, in McMaster University. It was one of the first dual degrees of combining the two. Um, and I also did a minor in psychology at the time. Then I went in and I got my PhD uh, from University of Toronto in the area of biomedical engineering and medical science. That's when I started getting into um, and, and looking at the brain of individuals who have neuropsychiatric disorders with technologies such as non-invasive brain stimulation. Then I went in and I did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School in, in the domain of cognitive neurology. That's where I started combining uh, technologies with each other, neurostimulation, neuroimaging, um, and, and used it toward um, creating and, uh, and exploring the impact of neurostimulation for treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders and mental health. Um, I took up my first faculty appointment at University of Toronto. So I was an independent scientist um, uh, at Center for Addiction and Mental Health and assistant professor at University of Toronto. Um, so that so I was a neuroengineer in the psychiatry department. Um, so so the idea was to leverage technology in order to advance the treatments and uh, and the solutions that we have uh, in order for betterment of. Uh, mental health um, in, in across the lifespan, really. Um, and then joining SFU, I was uh, I was recruited for for a chair, an endowed chair in technology innovations for youth uh, mental health and addiction recovery. Uh, the, the call for opening this position, I understand, was in part because of the crisis of opioid that we had in the region and mental health as being one of uh, the underlying factors that contributes contributes to this. Um, so I, I was positioned in, in this very transdisciplinary uh, position to bring uh, to bring visions from engineering and neuroscience and computer science and really combine disciplines to try to innovate technologies for this for this cause. So my program of research right now at Simon Fraser University is really heavily focused on uh, using uh, using neurotechnology and neuromodulation in particular to study the brain and use the concept of uh, plasticity to design new non-invasive treatments for youth depression and addiction. Um, I wear several national hats in which I work with uh, with scientists and clinicians and, and technologists across Canada and, and globally uh, to also collect uh, large volumes of, volumes of data on individuals going through various treatments, um, uh, particularly for depression, to, to also uh, inform how we can streamline the process of um, uh, matching patients with the right treatment, which is a hurdle in, in, in mental health in general, and more specifically in depression. It's an area that needs a lot of work, and I can get into that with further questions, perhaps. But just to paint a big picture, so I'm part of this national initiative called Canadian 
uh, biomarker integration network in depression. And I work with many colleagues and investigators across Canada and I'm leading uh, the initiative that is responsible for collection of uh, large volumes of brain data to inform some of these research that we conduct. Um, yes, and here locally at SFU, uh, we do have uh, we, we, we work, we have, um, I have, I lead a lab, I founded an, an direct center for engineering led brain research, uh, eBrain Lab, um, I can call it for short. And in eBrain Lab, uh, we have students coming from computer science, neuroscience, ecology, and particularly engineering. And uh, we do uh, cross cut all these uh, various fields to develop these technologies uh, for, for advancing the treatment and diagnostic uh, approaches in, in yeah for case. for many of our um, uh, listeners this is going to be a very fascinating and emergent uh, form of, of of research you know people may have had an MRI or a cat scan uh, with um, injuries or other um, health issues uh, but in terms of uh, the relationship of um, the forms of technology that you're using I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit about the field and kind of a recent um, uh, developments uh, in it, just to give a sense, because I think for, it's a fascinating uh, area, and and you've also uh, done work related to AI, machine learning, mm -hmm. and and how um, uh, certain forms of technologies can work alongside other um, uh, uh, forms of antidepressants or alternatives mm -hmm. to antidepressants in terms of how technology can can intervene. So it'd be great to hear a little bit about the the recent history of the field or the area that you're particularly working in. Yes, so I can highlight a couple of um, advancements here. Um, so first I start by the context and, and what the need is in this domain. So let's, we can take depression as an example. It's an area we've been heavily focused on recently. So one of the challenges in treatment of depression across the lifespan is, um, is connecting patients with the right treatment as early as possible. So what often happens is that patients uh, go through trial and error approach uh, with their physician uh, or through services to find out what works for them, and that process can take years. Uh, what has been missing, really, being some sort of an objective test. Um, so you mentioned MRI or a blood test, or it could also be a simple uh, sensor device that you wear on your head and collects your brain waves, for instance, something objective that we can collect in the doctor's office that would then say with X percent accuracy by 80% chance, uh, you're going to benefit from this treatment. So that has been, it's, it's missing, it's not really there yet. And, and there, there is a lot of research right now in part focusing a bit on more machine learning and leveraging the power of machine learning to facilitate that. And uh, through the work that I've, I've been doing with uh, some of the national initiatives, in particular CanBind that I mentioned, we've been able to collect large volumes of data in patients going through antidepressant treatments. And we recently um, uh, demonstrated that in fact, machine learning and data collected from patients non-invasively through sensors can be used to predict whether a particular patient is going to respond to a particular treatment um, ahead of the time. So at, at the beginning before the patient even starts getting that treatment. And, and, this, can, and this, this is one example of how machine learning can be used positively uh, in this domain to assist um, physicians, not to replace physicians, so that, that could be something that people may fear, but just to assist physicians in making more informed decisions uh, we have a long way to go. I mean, by no means we can say that, oh, so the AI is doing that already. Uh, we, we, have, we have done this for one type of antidepressant or a couple of types of antidepressants. Right now we're expanding that work to also include other classes of antidepressants. You can have pharmacological, you can have behavioral therapy, you can have brain stimulation. And, and we are very much engaged in the in, in providing these objective predictors of response to treatments for all classes of antidepressants and, and generally broadening it to include other kinds of um, mental health uh, illnesses as well. So this is one area that AI has shown concrete promises, uh, if we can call it AI, we can call it machine learning, 
has shown concrete promises and, and with more research, it, it's quite feasible. And also the methods that we have combined in machine learning include this non-invasive and rather inexpensive ways of recording data from the brain, which are far cheaper than MRI. It's called electroencephalo electroencephalography for our audience here, EEG in short. Um, and this method is far cheaper, it does not require a giant scanner. Um, right now there are portable versions of it so it can be easily placed in a doctor's office potentially um, and, um, and, and use that to sort of inform what is the best course of action for a given patient um, to reduce essentially with the ultimate goal of reducing the time that someone spends in untreated depression. Um, and by doing so, we really reduce a lot of burden to the patient, to the society, and ultimately costs that are associated with people going on um, with untreated depression that can lead to suicide, it can lead to um, addiction. Um, so a lot of times what we see with addiction is self-medication in part, and, and that leads to uh, overdosing um, and substance abuse and all things like that. And, and untreated depression is a big trigger of that. So, so we're hoping that this, in this way, technology can really help. Um, so this is one way mm -hmm. aim, that a technology can help. A second way is through um, developing technologies that can interface with the brain and target areas that are either somehow under-functioning or over-functioning and somehow deviating from normal functioning with more targeted treatments. So, so a class of treatments are pharmacological, and we all know that. Uh, it's the same thing in depression. So the pills, you take it. Um, they're, they're good. They help um, quite half of the patients who, who kind of benefit from it. But in some others, in some groups of patients, and the, the proportion is rather large, they may either experience side effect because of the systematic effect of the um, drugs, or they may not, or they may just not benefit from it in part because it's just somehow their brain is not metabolizing um, the, the pharmacological treatment or it's just, it's not the right way of treating, treating the condition. So the second class of technology that really is helpful is this more targeted, non-pharmacological, more targeted brain stimulation therapies um, that we're working on that allows us to focus on a particular brain region uh, whose functions uh, might be impaired, and through a targeted approach, uh, try to normalize the function to our treatment. So this, this we're experimenting a lot with this uh, in my program of research in youth with depression. They're the ones in whom uh, antidepressants, for instance, has, um, has you know, more side effects. There is a black box warning from FDA on some antidepressants for those 24 years and younger that it could create suicide ideation. Um, and so for them in part, uh, uh, there, there, is, there is more need in terms of alternative treatments. So we, we have been experimenting with a technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, for our audience, I can abbreviate that as TMS for short so that we can you know, refer to that. So this form of technology is non-invasive. Um, it's based on electromagnetic stimulation of, of the brain. So you can actually use it to target a specific area and, and, um, and modify its function through repetitive stimulation. So how does that look like as, a, as diagnostically is that you sit in a chair, you have this um, coil that is held over part of your brain that we're trying to study and you hear this tapping and feel this tapping sensation on your on your head and what this technology is doing is stimulating a population of neurons that are um, cells in our brain um, and, and, and triggers them and activates them and if we then combine that with for instance a monitoring device sensors that can help us listen to the brain activity then we can actually look at the function of that particular brain area Diagnostically, we've been using this technology to understand in those youth who do not respond to pharmacological treatments, what is it different in their brain compared to a healthy, normal uh, youth? Um, so is, is one area working too much? Is, is one area overconnected to another area? Um, is, so what is going on? So, and, and we recently published on that work uh, came out in 2020 where we actually show there are concrete differences 
so we can see it, it's observable with uh, this methodology that I described, and, and it seems to be uh, particular to the front part of the brain in the right hemisphere, for instance. Now, this is diagnostic part. Then taking the same technology, then again, we can tweak it a little bit um, and, and apply it more repetitively over multiple sessions. So here, for instance, four weeks of daily sessions of treatment targeted to that right or left part of the brain um, in order to modify the circuit uh, or the regions that we identified as having impairments. And, and then that's when we see actually a reduction in uh, symptoms of depression in youth. Um, so we've just finished a trial um, uh, and we published on that just um, in 2019. And there's one coming up hopefully in 2020 that we're working on that we actually show that using this methodology, those youth who do not respond to, uh, to uh, pharmacological treatments or refuse to receive pharmacological treatments going through this alternative treatment with non-invasive brain stimulation, their symptoms uh, drastically reduce and some of them become depression free. Um, so, so this is another aspect of our technology, uh, neuromodulation technology, we can call them, um, are, are proving useful for being leveraged for helping um, um, mental health uh, aspects. How of often in, 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 the, in the research do you combine uh, the use of technology with other forms of treatment or, or, or some studies been done where they're in simultaneous uh, use? Yeah, absolutely. So in fact, um, there are studies that suggest that some of these technologies, if combined, um, they can add a benefit. Um, in fact, we uh, just conducted a trial where we combined um, TMS that I just mentioned as a form of treatment with youth with a computerized cognitive training. So the idea being that in depression, there are two first lines of treatments. Uh, one is cognitive behavioral therapy, and the other one is pharmacological therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of times when combined with pharmacological uh, treatments have shown added benefit. Uh, so it's sort of essentially working with behavior, uh, whereas the pharmacological treatment, other tra treatments could be working more centrally from inside, inside the system. Uh, so we did combine in, in this particular trial uh, cognitive, um, a computerized version of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, so that is to overcome uh, the whole accessibility in part to one-on-one uh, -on -one psychological um, assessments that can be expensive to some parts. So that's something I can get into a bit later. Uh, but you're absolutely right, the combinatory treatments um, do have some added value, particularly when it gets to non-invasive brain stimulation. If you, for instance, you're stimulating front, uh, the frontal part of the brain and you maybe engage your participant in doing some sort of a task that engage that part of the brain, either during the stimulation or shortly after, um, there are research being done in that domain that shows benefit. Now, there needs to be you know, placebo control treatment trials to, to fully ascertain how much is the added benefit, uh, when do you combine them? How do you combine them? So those are all things that take time and, and, and you're trying to address them in research, but it's one area that we're really working on, yeah. Now, um, I imagine in, in the field when you're combining um, technology with uh, different forms of, of treatment on neurological disorders and um, other areas, there's in the field itself, the broader field, there, there are probably ethical questions that come up in the use of technology. I'm wondering if you could, you know, mention one or two sort of broadly in the field that um, have been sort of under consideration or questions that come up in the use of technology in, in, in this way. Yeah, there are, there are positive uh, effects and negative effects. Um, the, the positive effects is that a lot of times technology allows us to offer uh, treatments or interventions or solutions to a broader group of people. So in terms of inclusion, um, I think technology help us be more inclusive. Uh, for instance, thinking about people who are, who are living remotely and they don't maybe have access to a, a psychologist or clinicians who can offer cognitive behavioral therapy. Should we make that computerized and accessible, accessible somehow through the web 
so that they can see their psychologies more online and through the web if if access geographical location is is a is a, a bottleneck or if it's expenses are a bottleneck in this domain i think technology is really allowing us to be inclusive another positive effect back to the original idea of machine learning or ai helping is again shortening the time spent in in unsuccessful treatment trials um, so that is another aspect that i think technologies can really be uh, useful right mm -hmm. now there's always a fear of every time we leverage technology to do something uh, related to uh, improving mental health or just mental health or health in general and every time we use technology to solve a problem a challenge it can it can also be misused um, uh, or used for other purposes outside of the original purpose that it was created for um, so uh, so for instance um, so we are we are using treatments to maybe improve cognition right in 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 patients who have cognitive impairments so we can be using neuromodulation technologies applied to particular part of the brain to to uh, improve cognitive deficits for instance but then the same technology can be used to create superhumans for instance um, and just be applied in healthy normal controls uh, to give them an additive advantage in performing the cognitive task and then the question becomes so who should receive that who have access to that then is it a fair society if some people have booster treatments or so a, a, an analogy could mean doping in, in athletes um, mm -hmm. would that be considered sort of cheating if, if you have access to these kind of technologies so there are t there are for instance, non-invasive brain stimulation is being experimented for creating more focus in gamers. Um, so there's always that other aspect of augmentation that comes into picture. Now, I think what is very key and that conversation is happening is to have regulations. Um, so kind of like how we use internet. Internet has so many positive things, but also can have negative things. So regulations are absolutely key here. Now in the area of medical technologies, luckily there are a lot of regulations. Obviously things need to become approved uh, and go through very rigorous um, assessments before getting into the hand of end users and patients. So that is, uh, that is I, I don't foresee necessarily a problem in, in, in as we are offering treatments to patients. Um, now, mind you, they're always, uh, controversial treatments out there that maybe they don't do a placebo controlled trial and then they become more interested in making money out of the technology or so that is all the deals always are there and I think that has nothing to do with technology but the other side that we need to maybe be more careful and we need more regulations around are the consumer side of things that as these technologies um, help the patients in need what is the next step and how are we going to regulate it? How technology can be embedded in our lives just for healthy uh, individuals in general to, to advance that side. So that, that's my view on this. And it's a very important topic that needs to be paid a lot of attention to and we need regulations in place. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, around uh, looking at these kind of engineering uh, perspectives or, you, you know, you think of protracted um, existential uh, crises like climate change and people are talking about uh, geoengineering, for example, um, mm -hmm. similar with um, uh, health related issues, technologies can be brought in. And there's also the aspect of commercialization and other agendas being uh, brought to the table. So you have uh, figures like Elon Musk and, and, mm -hmm. and others and I'm wondering um, how in that, in that era, the, the, the areas in which people are attempting to commercialize these mm -hmm. technologies, what are some of the um, implications or, or specifically people like Elon Musk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Elon Musk is an interesting one. I do teach a course on neuromodulation at SFU to engineers and uh, you know so visionaries like Elon Musk make things that look a bit science fiction uh, look look more tangible and real uh, so that he just recently um, published uh, or had a how do you call it the press release on the link which is the newest uh, he called it Fitbit of the brain I think and 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 what he created is like this very elegant I suppose uh, we can call it a surgical robot that 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 actually implants this chip in the brain. Uh, well, he, he demonstrated in animals for now, um, and then this chip sort of 
has sensors that goes inside the brain and then connects with the tissue and then records. And, and, and so now this is feasibility demonstration. Um, obviously, um, at, the, at, at the broader picture of things, uh, the novelty here really is just putting all the pieces together and showing that this is possible, for instance, through uh, such a you know, packaged system of the surgery robot and the Fitbit that goes inside and, and the, the animals on which this was demonstrated on are, are healthy and alive and nothing bad is going on. Now, the, the positive side of seeing things that we saw with Elon Musk um, demonstration is that, so the, the, it's, it's no longer sci-fi. So things are going forward and our brain is gonna be connected to the computer. Uh, now, the, what I think will happen is that uh, we, need, we need a long way to go. I mean, the brain is a network, um, so it's not just one region that you put only one sensor on and that's good to go. It's going to solve everything. It's going to you know, solve depression, solve blindness, and solve, solve all kinds of issues like that. It's not that simple. Um, so this is a proof of principle that shows it's possible to have um, a Fitbit in your brain, but what really needs to advance is at the scientific level, at our knowledge of how the brain works. Um, how, so it, it's not that simple encoding of memories, or it's not that simple where exactly in the brain depression originates from. Uh, there are many scientists working on understanding that. There are many treatments that we're working on to offer, and we still have uh, fraction of understanding of how, how the brain works. So what will need to happen in the future is that it's fantastic that the, that the science has advanced for us to, be, to start not just imagining about how would it be like to have computers in our brain, but uh, we need a lot more research done in the area of where is in the brain that a youth depressed patient who's not responding to other treatments needs, uh, is not working well. Um, so where is that? So that is a million dollar question. And then we, we can use the technologies that we then see with Elon Musk to sort of go to that area or to design things, perhaps to offer treatments that way. Um, now at, at the society level, it's true also that going beyond mental health, um, so that, that we are getting closer and closer to computers. I mean, COVID-19 and the, the virtualization, virtualization of uh, social meetings and everything like that has made this digital world more and more closer to our brain, and it's true. And um, if uh, and and you know there there is no escaping from that that our brain needs to connect with this digital world, and there would be a positive connection, and that would be that perhaps a, a lot of uh, that deficits that our organic brain may have, or the shortcomings of our organic brain around perhaps our memory fading with time. So you can think of Alzheimer's disease and things like that, or some of these unfortunate conditions of neurodevelopmental disorders and then mental health and addiction. Those things are things that perhaps these technologies can help us a lot with. Um, it becomes to be determined how for a healthy brain, these technologies are gonna sort of push us um, to the next stage of being human. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is our interaction with this digital world and with the internet in a more seamless way. Um, right now we do it by still typing and uh, mm -hmm. thinking and, uh, you know, uh, but I think it's gonna get more and more seamless uh, with what we're seeing. And, and I think people like Elon Musk, uh, they're bringing the technology closer to, to where we are, but we need to also have a lot more research done um, to understand where do illnesses originate from. Yeah, we have uh, yeah. philosophers of technology here at uh, SFU, like Andrew yeah. Feenberg, that can uh, yeah. weigh in on these questions as a former student yeah. of uh, Herbert uh, Marcuse. Um, I, I studied with uh, Catherine Malibu, who's uh, written about plasticity in a philosophical mm -hmm. sense as yeah. an idea coming out of uh, neuroscience. And, and also, uh, I've been thinking about these questions a little bit more around the brain, myself having had a, a seizure, a stroke, and brain surgery over the last two years. Luckily, everything ended up um, uh, all right. But th these questions around um, brain plasticity, uh, that the brain is, is plastic and can rewire itself, these are uh, questions and um, uh, thinking that you're trying to apply technology to. And wondering if yeah. you can talk a little bit about how uh, the use of technology and its sort of connection to uh, plasticity are working themselves through uh, research and other questions. 
Yeah, yeah. So plasticity is what uh, make us be very adaptable as as species. So um, and it, it's a very it's a concept that we apply a lot in when we create interventions. Particularly, I, I mentioned this class of neuromodulation technologies that we're experimenting with. Uh, TMS um, keyword I I mentioned in, in regards to youth depression and creating these treatments. So. The reason these treatments work are in part because the brain is plastic. And so if you do, if you do perturb the brain one time, uh, maybe nothing really happens, but if you reinforce this perturbation over repeated session, uh, the brain has this capacity to start rewiring itself. Um, and and, and that, that, is, that is something that we leverage um, with, for creating treatments. And, um, and, and that's something that also allows us to treat conditions. It's that, that function of the brain neuroplasticity. Um, now, plasticity itself can be also be uh, malfunctioning in some, some conditions. So there's a possibility of that, that as well, that uh, some conditions might be associated with too much plasticity uh, and some conditions maybe um, might be uh, associated with low plasticity so that those are areas of research that some investigators are also uh, for instance looking into um, in particularly in our in our research area uh, so we are harnessing plasticity to take these long-term changes i mentioned the idea of combining treatments uh, for instance with transcranial magnetic stimulation and computerized cognitive training um, and and the underlying concept here at play is that when we repeat that over time and we do it daily, uh, that's when the brain starts to change. And what we're really able to see is with this neuromoderate monitoring devices that we have, um, we can actually monitor the changes over time. So in some of our work uh, that we has actually recently been accepted for publication, we actually do show that the brain changes. So before the treatment, um, these neurocircuitries look um, in certain ways, but then after two weeks of treatment, they look slightly different. So there's this change that happened, right? Um, and and this, is, this is in part a very powerful mechanism that uh, the, the brain is, has the capacity to, 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 to do. And it does not necessarily go away with age. It may get a little bit weaker as we get older and older, but the plasticity does exist across the lifespan. And, and this is what makes it really exciting for us to use technologies. So for instance, it's possible to stimulate one part of the brain concurrently with another part of the brain and through repeated um, application of such treatment, make these two brain areas start connecting with each other. Now at the big picture level, there might be conditions um, under which left or right side of the brain, maybe they're not talking properly, um, there might be conditions under which perhaps two brain networks are not talking properly. By, by tailoring these neuromodulation technologies and by uh, sort of in reinforcing these areas to start firing together or functioning together, we're able to actually create treatments and, and create new connections in the brain, which sort of goes back to the whole idea of ethics of neuroscience and neuroscience of ethics, right? Because if you're able to change people's brain and maybe with that you change even their personality or, um, you know, and their behavior, then the question is, uh, so how, how can we make people be accountable perhaps uh, for some of the conditions that they have? Um, so these are very interesting areas also that the more and more we understand how there are concrete neurocircuitries in the brain that are responsible for pretty much all human behavior. Um, and also we need to revisit also ethics. Of, okay, so... What, so we need to provide these treatments uh, equally to everybody. Uh, we need to understand better, you know, how much of uh, what we see behaviorally is that we have full control over, we have free will, or how much of it is driven by our brain circuitries. And through neuromodulation and plasticity in the brain, we can direct them to the right direction. So it could be either getting healthy from, from having conditions like mental health and addiction. Uh, it could also be, you know, uh, for a healthy individual wanting to, you know, be in certain way, because uh, we're all born with a brain we're born with, but if it's plastic and we have the technologies to change it, so, you know, at the philosophical level, so what can we do with that knowledge, right? What are you uh, most excited about in your uh, research that you're undertaking right now? 
Yeah, so um, the two areas that I mentioned at the great beginning around uh, matching patients with the right treatment and creating new treatments for youth with depression and addiction, those are areas that um, I'm very excited about. Um, so we also do, I, I'm also very much into community engagement type of research where we do not create these technologies just as scientists wearing our scientist hat and thinking what the patients need. Um, I do engage in, um, in, in community engagement campaign to take perspective of people with lived experience. Uh, for instance, I work with partners like uh, such as John Wilkin Academy in Surrey um, to create some of this computerized cognitive training that I mentioned earlier with, with their uh, input. Um, and so that makes them to be more adherent to the treatments also if, if, if we create technologies that is what they need um, so they, or what they enjoy uh, being uh, adhering to or being compliant to or using on a daily basis. There, there, there is higher chance that they would use these technologies. So that's another area that this community engagement uh, piece is, is very exciting um, to me, at least. Um, and, and I see this, this concept of co-creating technology with all stakeholders. I think back to the regulation ethics of things. When you co-create um, technologies with taking into account the needs and the wishes of um, all stakeholders that are involved, uh, there is a better chance of creating something that is both ethical and, and also it is something that will be used and would actually be scaled um, to, to benefit uh, Canadians and globally people suffering from various conditions. So this aspect of my work where I take this co-creation aspect and engage various partners into this um, and bring various disciplines also. Um, I mentioned my background in research, it, it really... I, I really do work with clinicians, physicians, engineers, computer scientists um, to, to, to lead this type of work. And that opens up um, a lot of interesting conversations. And, and that's, in my, in my opinion, is an exciting step that is happening in this field. Uh, areas that didn't know anything about each other are now connecting with each other. So there is an area, for instance, personalities are something that we're told that we're born with. But, and, and there are a lot of personality disorders for which sometimes treatments are limited. But if we can pinpoint the brain circuitries that are perhaps underlying those, um, those uh, personalities, we can create treatments for them and, and we can offer solution to a lot of people who might have been suffering from conditions that were otherwise considered untreatable or, um, or not having that much uh, choice of treatments for. So offering solutions where there was none, uh, it's what it gets, it gets me going. And, and I think the fact that making people, the people suffering uh, be much shorter in time through using machine learning and some of these technologies that we have and creating new treatments, I think that's something that's very exciting. Mental health and addiction issues take many years of life from individuals, not only individuals, but also their caretakers. Um, it, it can be very hard. Um, historically, it's been very stigmatizing. So a lot of people have not been even talking about it. Uh, so you, you have a broken leg, uh, everyone recognizes, or you have cancer, everyone has recognition for that. You get a lot of uh, empathy. So with mental health, there has been a lot of secrecy and it has been a lot of oh, you don't know where to ask for help. So people have been suffering in silence. So if there is one thing that I hope our work would do is to break that silence and it would bring people of different disciplines together uh, to create something that would be of use to people who are suffering. Do you think uh, that in the future there would be opportunities to combine um, technological interventions with harm reduction approaches, particularly related to addiction? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's one area we're also experimenting with. So we started, so we have rolled out um, the computerized cognitive training program that I mentioned. We actually develop with youth undergoing addiction recovery. Um, and um, yes, I mean, the next step would be, okay, how can we uh, potentiate its effect? Can we combine it with other harm reduction uh, or can we even combine neurostimulation with other harm reduction to shorten the amount of time spent in, in uh, addiction recovery programs or not to shorten, but even uh, improve 
um, the, ex the, the benefit of existing programs um, and, and sort of give to individuals more quality life. Um, because, you know, at the beginning, recovering from addiction is, is like a very difficult task and so many people relapse. So if we can somehow combine treatments to, to, to sort of give it a critic, more super treatment, um, that is absolutely an area that, that we're working in. We're, we're, we're actively in it um, uh, with depression. So we have actually run trials and, and we, we, with addiction, we're, we've done the first step of creating a computerized training and then the next steps would be combinatory treatments also. Fernick, thank you so much for joining us on Below the Radar. It's a really fascinating area of research and look forward to uh, following uh, your work. Thank you. Thank you, Aim. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening in to our conversation with Farinik Farzan about the exciting research being done in the emerging field of neuroengineering. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time. 